Hey y'all, I'm James Wright, and welcome to my shop. Today we are talking about the yokes from the Reed Plane Parts, and this will be the final video in the installation series, so let's dive in. As always with the video, there are PDF instructions as well. I'll leave a link to those down below so you can print these out and follow along on there. The yokes come in two different types. Number one, there is the file to fit. And this is a little larger in all its diameters. It also needs to have a hole drilled. It sounds a little scary, but we'll be showing you very simple ways of doing that. Number two, there is the split style here where you can drive a screw in to expand this and fill your chip breaker. This one already has a cast hole, so it's a little bit easier to drill out, but we'll be going through this. First, we're going to start off with the file to fit and go through this step by step. How do you get this working? Very first, we need to take the plane apart, pull it out, and then we're going to take the frog off. So we're going to take these screws out. With the frog out of the body, we're going to remove the adjustment screw. And now we want to take this frog out. And it is actually held a pin that goes all the way through the body. You want to get a good punch to put that out. And I've got links to the ones I use down below. Uh, this one is 3 30 seconds and it is just about perfect. You can usually get it within a 1 8th, uh, but sometimes the pin is a little bit smaller. Stanley changed the size on these from time to time. Also, because this is a casting, it can be very, very easily broken. And so this is probably the most dangerous step of driving that pin out. I'm gonna actually rest it on this and secure the casting a little bit on the corner of a piece of wood. That will just protect it so when I'm pounding it, it's not gonna pop out. Then I'm gonna grab a little mallet hammer and lightly tap it. I'm gonna make sure that indeed the pin is moving before I really try and hit it. And you don't need much force at all. You just need a very steady and very, very careful hand because you do not wanna break this casting. And with the moving, I'm gonna drive it all the way out until it's gone far enough that I can pull the yoke out and it's sticking out the other side. I generally like to leave it in so that I know it goes back in the same direction it came in, but if it comes all the way out, don't worry about it too much. I just like to leave it right there. Now with the frog removed and all the parts out, we're going to take our attention back to the yoke. We need to do some adaption on here before we go any farther. So first we wanna measure the size inside diameter of your adjusting screw. And especially if you are using an antique one, uh, that may have worn down and changed sizes over the years. So we're going to set this on here and lock it. And mine is 0.379. Then I wanna make sure I have at least that measurement on here. And this one is actually right on, it's good and tight. If this gap is too small, then you can take a file and you can widen it out a little bit. Taking a few shavings off either side, and then check it again. Another idea that might help some of you is to grab a firmer chisel, or in this case, a big slick. And I can come in here and measure and find out exactly where it is that thickness. And then I can put this on and slide it up until it reaches at least that point, or a little farther, like this one. If you have a firmer chisel or something like that, it actually works pretty well. If your yokes are a bit too wide and you need to crush them down, put them on top of the leg of your bench with a big mallet, just give them a good tap, and that will squeeze them back together so then you can file them to be the exact fit and get a nice good fit so it doesn't move side to side once it's in there. So now we have a very nice fit between these. We need to work on getting these balls to then fit in between there. They're always a little bit large because especially with the antique ones, those, that gap tends to spread over the years. If your nut has expanded a decent amount over the years, you may find that this actually has a good bit of slop and moves around in there. To make these a little bit bigger, you can take a punch and slowly work them down and you can widen out each head to make them fill that gap a little bit better. But most of the time, these are gonna be too big, so we want to actually file little ways to make them fit in there. So I wanna set the yoke on here so that the arm is at 90 degrees to the shaft of the nut. And there needs to be a little bit more taken off. You'll notice how these have a little more bulge on this side. I'm gonna take off material on this side to make them fit down in there with a nice slide. So I'm gonna set it down here, take the file, just take a couple light passes across the top and then check it. Always take few passes and then check it, and then a few passes and then check it, so that you're not taking off too much. You wanna get a nice tight fit here because this will remove a lot of the slop. And we're almost there now. If I push it, I can jam it down in there, but I can't move it around much, so we're actually going to do a little more work. It's pretty close though. Then after about five minutes or so of slowly filing and checking, now we've got the nice fit in there. It's just got a little bit of friction that's what I want right there. A little bit of friction is fine. You're gonna be able to wear it down and it will give you a really good clean fit. 
Next, we're gonna move over to the scary part. How do you drill that hole? Mmm. One of the big reasons that Stanleys have so much slop is that their hole is far, far larger than it needs to be, and it's also beveled in on both sides, so there's a lot of side-to-side -side movement on here. And we really don't want that. We want a nice, clean hole that is relatively tight to the pin so that there isn't much movement on the yoke. All sorts of crazy jigs and ideas for holding it straight and drilling it out have been proposed, uh, but honestly, you've already got a jig, and this will allow you to do several other adaptions. So with it all taken apart, now we're going to put on the nut and slide the yoke into place. We want to make sure that that's a fitting down in there. Then we're going to slide it all into place. We want to make sure that the yoke is sticking out at 90 degrees to the frog, and the meat of the body is in line with the hole. Once that's in place, now we can mark the hole. That can be done with an eight penny nail, a center punch, or an appropriately sized awl that will then fit the circumference and give you a good point on there. We're just gonna give it a light tap. And that will mark the center of it so that we know where to drill. We can then take it apart and drop the pieces on the floor. We now have a spot exactly where we want to drill, and this will give us the location, but how do we know we're drilling at 90 degrees exactly into this? Now I could use a blank like this if I have a drill press and drill my hole appropriately there, but I'm gonna show you how to do it with a bit and brace and the old yoke and get that exactly where you want it to be. Now at this point, you want a drill bit that is really, really close to the size of the pin. And so most of these pins are right about an eighth of an inch. Mine is actually a little under an eighth of an inch it's at 0 0.121 rather than 0.25. So that means I could drill it with the standard eighth inch, but it's gonna be a hair sloppy. So I'm actually gonna go with a letter size down and make it almost exactly the same size as this, just a little bit of slop. It's always nice to have a really good set of drill bits with letter sizes you can get exactly what you want. So what I do with mine is I put them in the vise and I line up the old yoke with the dot and the new yoke. So when I put my bit through, it touches that, and this will allow me to center it. And then I can also use the ring trick to make sure that I'm level this way, and I drill precisely on that hole. It actually works really well, and this is how I've done all of mine so far. So I'll slide it through, I'll set it right on that dimple, and I'll start turning, and watch the ring. Try and keep the ring in the middle, so I can get a nice, clean drill hole all the way through. After that, I'm gonna come in with a little reamer, just clean it out a little bit, get rid of the burr on the edge, and we've got a really nice hole ready to fit the pin in. So with all that done, now we can wind it all back into place and get ready to put that pin back into the slot. Again, be very, very careful. Light taps, make sure it's lined up nicely with the yoke. Down until it's flush and maybe even come in with a punch, do it just a hair blow. There we go. And there we have a really nice tight fit. It still spins relatively well. That'll loosen up a little bit as it gets used. And we're ready to put the iron on and fit this then to fit. So when I take the iron and I put it on there, it shouldn't slide all the way down. There should be a gap in there. And that's just because that yoke is so fat that it is filling up the gap on the chip breaker. So let's do a little filing and get that clean down to its sides. So I'm gonna set it in here, then bring my file in. File a little bit on this side, file a little on this side, and then we can come back in and check it again. Also keep in mind, the chip breaker is up high and the iron is down low, so you're not shaving this all the way down at the base, you're shaving it up a little ways. You wanna make sure that it can get all the way down there, but the chip breaker doesn't have to get all the way down to the bed, uh, just the iron, so the chip breaker stops a little above the bed of the frog. After a little more work, now it will bed all the way down in, and there's just a hair of movement. We'll work with that a little bit. Now here's the next problem. This is sticking up a good bit above the top of the chip breaker. And if I bring the lever cap in, it hits that. This can't get all the way down, so we need to file this down until it's the same height as this. To fix that, I'm gonna come in with an awl, and I'm gonna mark it here, and I'm gonna mark it on this side, and then we can take this off 
and file it down to those marks. Now, if you're working with a thin original iron, it may actually be faster to cut it off with a hacksaw, but for most of these, it's actually gonna be quicker to file it down. Then when you're getting close to your line, just before you get there, put the iron on and let's do a little quick check just to make sure that this will work because you can actually stop a little before and have it stick up a little bit farther. You just wanna make sure when it's sticking up that it doesn't run into this spring on the lever cap. You want it to stay a little lower. So I gotta take it just a hair lower than that, but we should be pretty good. With all that being done, we can now put it all back together and check our handiwork. One of the big tricks to this whole process is that you want to make sure you are filing very slowly and methodically. The slower you file, the more accurate you're going to be and the more slop you can take out of it. And so now there is almost no slop in this at all. It's really, really tight. Even though I'm moving it back and forth, uh, this isn't moving up and down. There's a little bit of side to side movement and that's okay, but I don't want it to move up and down. So beforehand with this one, I had four and a half rotations until it would gauge. And now I have the distance from there to there. That's the total slop in this is about a quarter turn on this nut. So that would be about an eighth of a turn on the old nut. <laughs> Basically, no slop at all. Really nice tight fit. I love that. With the split yoke though, everything is basically the exact same. Fitting it in is gonna take the same amount of filing or crushing it down to make it fit a little bit better. You wanna get a nice tight fit between these two. You're going to, then when it comes to drilling out the hole, this hole is actually really, really close. And on one of them, the pin slid all the way through. And on the other one, I just need to do a little bit of work. On this one, however, the hole is a bit small and I'm gonna to have to drill it out. The nice thing is it's already pre-drilled, so I can grab a drill and an auger and just run this through and I've got a nice clean fit on there. When it comes to inserting it into the body, you may still have to do a little bit of filing on the face of these to get it to fit all the way into the chip breaker, but most of the time it will slide pretty well in there. The nice thing about this is it will allow you to expand the head so that it will grab the chip breaker much, much tighter. Most of the time, I can just grab the screw and drive it down in there and run it out, but sometimes it comes in to have a little countersink in here, and you can twist it on there and ream it out just a little bit, and that will give you enough to start the threads and make it a little bit easier to run this down in. With all in place, you then put the screw into the slot, drive it down in until you have a good tight fit. The problem then is you've got the screw sticking out, so you're gonna have to come through with diagonal cutters or wire cutters and snip this off. And then you can come in with a file and clean out the tip of this just like we did on the other one, make, making sure that it's flush or just a little proud so that the lever cap doesn't run into it as it comes out of the chip breaker. All told, these are much easier to install. They just don't give you quite as much workability. The, the file to fit will fit most planes really, really well, but this one is just a little bit easier, a little less work. And in general, with the screw, you're gonna get a very, very nice tight fit between the tip of this and your chip breaker. And now it's time to be a bit honest with you. This is the hardest step of all of these installations. It will take a little bit of work and you may end up causing problems and messing things up, but nice thing about these is you can always fix it. Uh, they are brass and they're easily moved around. So if it gets too big, you can pound it back together. If you filed off too much, you can put a punch in there and mushroom it out and then you have more material to work with. The nice thing about the brass is it's very flexible and you can do a lot with it. So play around with it. If you have problems, let us know and we'll talk you through it. This is one of the things that I really didn't think I would like with removing the slop because it just doesn't affect me. I, I've gotten so used to just spinning through it and not having a problem. But now that I've gotten rid of the slop on several of my planes, it is really, really nice. And it's something that I now, um, I, I, I kind of like because it's very, very easy just to do that quarter turn and I'm there. I don't have to think about making sure I'm up or down. If I forget to tighten it against the iron, it, the iron's not gonna move enough to really make that big a difference. And so getting rid of the slop is actually surprisingly nice. So if you come up with an installation idea that makes this easier, please let us know. We're always adding to this and we are occasionally updating the instructions. So if we learn something new that will add something to this, uh, let us know on there. As always, we're wanting to learn new things as well. So I hope you like this. If you do think of anything that you think would help us out, let us know in the comments down below or send us an email. Also, if you do hit like, comment, share, and subscribe, it really helps out the channel. So I think that'll do it for now. And until next time, have a wonderful day. Most Stanley planes have so much slop they make a pig salivate. The Anti-Slopper! Get yours now at woodbyright.com backslash shop. So with it all taken apart, now we're going to put...